We're going to take you to Carmel Valley, where we're going to meet a furniture artist. This is a man who makes chairs. I wouldn't sit on them, although they're certainly worthy of it, because they are truly art pieces. We're going to meet Ambrose Pollock, who makes art furniture. Oh, how do you see this? This piece is how heavy? Well, when it arrived here, prior to the first three cuts, it was nine tons. Nine tons? 18,000 pounds. How'd you get it in here? It came in on a big flat rack from Matson Lines, and we uh, took a look at it, and prior to, uh, we knew that we were gonna have to get a crane to get it off the truck, so we hired a crane to come. There's only one crane service in this area. It had to come from Castorville, which is over there in the middle of the bay. And so he was sitting here waiting for the truck to come, and uh, we had it all positioned. I told him where I wanted it, and he put the crane there, backed the truck over there, and swung it right into here, and one time, down it went. <laughs> and never and, to be moved again, I don't it think. Sits. <laughs> it sits forever. Yeah. I'd like you to meet Ambrose Pollock. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Ambrose is a master woodworker, and woodworker is I don't think even a, a, the proper title for you. You should see the furniture that he makes. It is really wonderful. And it starts here, and it starts with the heart, I think. Uh, must be. I think uh, the wood got into my blood, so it must be in my heart, too. And how long ago did it do that? Well, I started working wood when I was about 22 years old. And uh, I started when I was living in Hawaii. So this tree is from Hawaii, and I'm still, I fell in love with this kind of wood over there, and I still, uh, it is one of my favorites to work And today. what is this? What kind of wood is this? This is a, it's a Hawaiian wood called acacia, koa. It's a, it's an in, a tree that's indigenous to Hawaii. It's leguminous in nature. In other words, it's related to the pea family. And it has little, when it's born, it has little tiny leaves, and then when it, grows up it has big long sort of uh, olive colored leaves like a eucalyptus so it's uh, it takes about for a tree this size to grow about five or six hundred years and this is one of the oldest koa trees I've ever seen 600 year old tree right do you how good do you feel about it being here well I have mixed feelings about it being here uh, Number one, I just looking at the, the girth of this tree and the convolutions in the side of it, uh, it must have been absolutely magnificent. Uh, and it, so I have mixed feelings. I sort of wish this tree was still standing so people could enjoy it in its living state. And but, this came to you already cut. They didn't, you didn't have this tree cut. This no, was no. Uh, a situation where developers cut through, uh, what, a forest of trees, a stand of trees, and this was one of them. Well, it, they went looking for certain trees. Uh, they, did, they did not clear cut the area. They just went looking for specific trees. So in all fairness to them, they, they only cut select trees, not like the modern lumbering practices we have today where they'll a lot of times go in and just level an area. Mm -hmm. They went through and made some roads and found as they went through the forest, a few trees and this was one of this is a heartbreaker but i have to say that it couldn't be in better hands if it's going to come down and it's going to be made into something else i would rather see this tree in your shop than a lot of other people's shops that is why they sent it to me that's what they said when they sent it to me because they they looked at the tree and it was so convoluted and and unique that they couldn't imagine it being turned into lumber and I told them what I was looking for. First of all, I, I should preface it by saying I wanted a large tree, but only four feet. This one's six feet in diameter. And so it's uh, a little bigger than I... But it gives you I... a slab <laughs> that's incredible. Now, you've taken a couple pieces off this. Come right. on over here. I want to want to uh, look at some of these pieces that were the first and second cuts. I guess first, second, third cuts, maybe? The one here on the left is the first cut. In order to cut that, I had to build a carriage up on top so the first cut was here. I cut these sections off here with a chainsaw, which yeah. is standing over there. So we had some large bulbs sticking out that will probably turn into bowl blanks for turning. And uh, you can see the nature of the tree. It was just a lot of in and out in this tree. But the other side is the actual first cut. The second cut is over there, and this is the third cut. Now, what would you do? I know one of the amazing things about your work is that you can see as an observer, what you saw in the wood, whether it's a table or it's a chair, we're gonna look at that in just a minute. 
I plan on making tables for, for people that can see the beauty of the tree. A lot of people relate to wood as two by fours. The people that, that would be able to appreciate this will, will be able to appreciate it in, in the form it's in. I, I make tables that have natural edges. Uh, and it really, to honor this, this piece of wood, I'm probably gonna just keep it in pretty much this position. It, it will be cut to length. I try to, like, there's bark there. Yeah. I try it in end grain, which generally doesn't polish up or plane very well. So this table will probably be either cut off here or up there somewhere. If someone sees it and they want it this long, then they can have it. Or we'll work with the solid sections on this. And, now, uh, would you cover this up or would you let this show? You would let this show. I've been thinking about that. Uh, it, there's many things you can do. I'd probably just leave it. In the old days, back in the old hippie days of California, they'd fill this in with resin and put plants and stuff and seashells in there. And, Ooh. Uh, you know, it would be really funky. And they, then it would all turn yellow and brown and, you know, no, fade good. out. No, good, no. Not gonna happen. natural. I no. mean, that's the beauty of a piece like this. Yeah. Now, this piece over here with the whale on it right. is, um, why'd you put the whale in there? Oh, okay, well, I can show you why I put the whale in there. On the back side, there's a, what's called a heart check running right through. Um, the right way, through the heart of the grain. Right through, there was a limb coming out of this section of wood. So on the back side of this, you can see a big crack. So, no. what is one going to do? Uh, exactly. The dog would probably put a rock in there. But <laughs> he likes his rock. I so what I, buddy over here. I was either going to put a bird in there or something, this wood came from the Salinas Valley, from Spreckles. And because it's kind of in the proximity of the coast here, I chose to put a killer whale of ebony, and that's just the natural ebony in there. We but, have a lot of sea life around here, so. But part of that is that you're seeing, um, you see the ocean. I mean, there's this, you, you're looking at something, which is really more of a picture in the grain of the wood. Right, I, I saw either sky <laughs> or water. And this looks like a pool of water to me, so I, the whale seemed to just come to mind. Oh, yeah. What's your dog's name? This dog's name is Luke. and He's, he's trying to steal the scene. He's a recent guy. He doesn't he's know the good... ropes around here. <laughs> he doesn't, but he likes his rocks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at some of your work over here. Okay. This is gorgeous. Okay. Let me tell you what I see first, all right? All right. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. I mean, first of all, it's what kind of wood? That this I don't know. This is Claro Walnut. It's indigenous to California. Claro. Claro. C-L-A-R-O. Claro. And what we see here is a little bit of black worked in. Now, you've got a stripe that runs right down the center, but you've got an ergonomic shape. Why? Well, the woman that ordered the originals on these chairs wanted a carved seat. And so, rather than just making some, you know, shallow scoop that you see in a production chair, I wanted it to fit to one's uh, anatomy better. So, yeah. have a seat. Try it out. So <laughs> Let's see if it fits my anatomy. Oh, wow, is that ever comfortable? I try to make chairs that are comfortable. That's, this is beautiful. Oh, but you know what? You almost don't want to sit in it because it's so pretty, you don't want to cover it up. Now, you've done something really interesting on the back. I'll scoop this around just a bit. You've got the teeth of the seat coming through. Why? Well, to uh, provide extra support, um, I just like the way it looked. It, it reminded me of some of the green and green influences I've seen where they s provided real soft edges and kind of a geometric shape. And it really contrasted nicely to the elegance of the back. It was basically a functional thing to carry the weight of this wood, too. And uh, rather than running these, for, there's a functional reason. If I ran these into the, the, the seat bottom and made a mortise and tenon joint, I would have had to haunch it so it could move around and make, try to make a real clean joint here. So I chose to just provide some interest and difference. I've never seen anybody do that before, so I wanted uniqueness in the chair, too. I think you're very, being very humble about your art and how you feel about your art, because what I'm hearing is function, and I'm not hearing art. I think there's a lot more art that goes into this than you're admitting. <laughs> Well, okay. it, I let other people call me an artist. I just do what I do. And it's, if it comes out looking pretty, then everybody wins. I really feel that uh, the wood speaks louder than anything. 
I really try to showcase the wood and provide natural harm, harmonistic looking pieces. If you want to call it art, then go ahead. I, I think it's more functional than art, but... Well, I'm not the only one who would call it art. I think most of the folks out there would. This now, you have a very tapered arm here, and that's unusual. Usually in this kind of a chair, you have a fatter arm here, and then it tends to either be straight or uh, be smaller here at the end. You've got it going the other direction. Um, it just suits my eye better. I, I see something uh, more natural and almost anatomical in that arm. Uh, the way it's attached to here, it reminds me of the way an arm grows out of a body, incidentally, too. Also, this was in influenced by early green and green pieces of furniture. They made arms that were delicate like that and nicely shaped. There's some real elegance to that, that arm. It is an elegant chair, and yet it's so sturdy, and that's, an, uh, that's a hard combination. In furniture building, that's one of the toughest things to achieve. This table, you've got studded with abalone. Right. That uh, is darling. I thought it complemented the, uh, the Italian marble real nice. Very elegant, again, very simple simple lines here. What I really like about this is the fact that this is all one piece. Right. So you're into carving now as well. This is not joinery in the back here. This is uh, all one big piece here. Right. Correct? That's correct. And uh, there again, it's, it picks up some of the early arts and crafts stylings. A lot of this stuff would, would have been done with inlays in the old days. They'd put inlay copper and they'd have scallop shapes up here or flowers. Well, I chose just to do these shapes. I, I did it on paper first, and I liked what I saw, so I just did it in wood. And this is a koa wood, similar to those trees over there, the same kind of wood. And this is what those trees will look like when it's done up? Right, when it's polished. Oh, those are so beautiful. Now, this is a stickly. Now, I know you were influenced by stickly. Stickly and shaker was in your background. Somewhat, yes. Now, but this isn't stickly, and why is it different? Well, this one has more of a shaker front leg, and... The mortise and tenon joints are up here are proud, which is different. And it also has a leather seat, which is a little bit different. Some of the earlier mm -hmm. stickly pieces had leather seats. I don't know what's really different. Why do you say it's different? Well, I see more curvature in the lines. I see exaggerated. I see stickly was a little shorter in the back. You've got you've made it longer. Yes, I um, I see some curve. I see your influence here. This this handle again wants to curve back in here. It feels more organic than um, than a stickly does. A stickly is a very straight line. It's almost architectural, whereas this is more movement. Well, uh, there's a little Frank Lloyd Wright in here, too. These tall backs were influenced Aha! by I Frank Lloyd Wright. I knew there was Wright. a reason. And He's my uh, buddy. Yeah. Okay, and this one? Now, this wood, what is this? This is big leaf western maple, and it's one of my favorite woods now to work with because it's, number one, it's uh, less expensive than some of the uh, more deluxe uh, domestic hardwoods. Believe it or not, this wood, uh, they used to just turn it into wood pulp and make paper out of oh, it. Oh, you're kidding. And then people started getting wise to the fact that that was happening, and they were calling out all the good curly stuff now. And they make guitars out of this now, musical instruments, fiddle back. That's what this is called. Mm -hmm. And it's featured in a lot of uh, electric. You have to see this. This is a, your sense of humor. <laughs> Look at the way the grain turned out on the seat of this chair. Well, incidentally, that's just what happens when you carve a bottom of the seat. <laughs> carve a bottom. Okay, let's take a look at this table. This is one of the most beautiful pieces, and believe it or not, this was sitting in his kitchen. I mean, this is a peanut butter and jelly table, and boy, I think it would look awfully nice in my dining room. Well, so. some people call it an ironing board. It's sort of a Neolithic uh, <laughs> Neanderthal does. ironing board, but... Uh, it was influenced to, uh, by uh, George Nakashima, who I met uh, in 1982. Back in, uh, I went on a pilgrimage to some of my favorite woodworkers back when I was younger, and I don't have time to travel now. <laughs> I'm yeah. too busy working. Oh, this is magnificent. And you've got all kinds of, you can see your, your the early work and where you were headed um, just in this piece. Right. Oh. Uh, I think I was real idealistic when I started out, and I did a lot of exploration and, and uh, tried some different ideas and this wood came to me and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. It sat in my shop for about five years and finally it just emerged as a table and uh, that's the way things are. I can't explain it. Sometimes uh, you just have to wait for the thing to evolve and that's what happens. It, this is a, again, this is the same wood as that except this is a burl, uh, uh, 
you can look at the edge here and see the the malignant part of the tree and uh, so it's a similar piece as that that over there the bottom all, there again is a quilted western maple so it, it this looks almost like marble to me on this end piece so that's why I made a slab out of that it. That is beautiful. Well listen I want to remind you what Michelangelo said he always said that the statue was inside the marble he just brought it out I'd say you're in good company. Thank you very Thank much you. for being a Thank part you, of the Lynn. show. I'm still amazed at that giant chunk of wood in his driveway. I can't wait to see that someday, made into something incredible.